You turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 once again. Told you last week that what we had started was going to take us a couple sessions. Philippians chapter 2, we'll read verses 5 through 11. Lifting up the name of Jesus once again. I want you to remember this. It's something I just said. But my grandson, I think, shocked his mother the other day. She asked him, who loves you best? Of course, she was, aunt, she was expecting mama. She asked him, who loves you best? And just that quick, he said, Jesus. I want you to remember when you're having a bad day and you think nobody cares, Jesus loves you best. We're going to try to lift up that lovely name of Jesus today. We want to bring him praise and glory and honor in his house today. Will you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's bow. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for giving your only begotten Son, that through him we might have life that He came, lived, and died, and rose again for our justification, that we might be saved, forgiven, cleansed, adopted into the family, O oh Father. Help us to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we want to bring Him glory and honor and majesty in His house today. And I just ask You to help me. Help me deliver the message in a way that it's receivable, that it's understandable, that every person in this room, youngest to oldest, will be able to to understand that Jesus loves them. And it's in that name, that name most precious that we pray, that name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are in a time of year when we set aside to honor God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a time that we stop to count our blessings, or at least attempt to count our blessings and to give thanks to God. You know, we ought to thank Him for daily sustenance. We ought to thank Him for people, relationships that He puts in our life. Things that sometimes we take for granted and overlook. I challenge you to stop. Take the time to give God thanks for the home you have, for the food in the pantry that you have, for just everything. But we also celebrate the fact that Jesus came into this world and gave His life for old sorry lost sinners like me. And like you, sadly, most people in our world are ignorant of Jesus for the real reason for this season that we're going through. But those of us who do know also know that there is nobody like Jesus. Jesus loves us best, don't he? In the history of the world, many billions of people have lived and died. Many have left their mark on this world. But none has left an impression like Jesus did. You see, Jesus was a humble Jewish man. A humble Jewish man in the flesh. But he was also God. And he changed the course of history. He was not just an ordinary man. Who he was and what he did forever altered the flow of human history and changed eternity for countless millions. So I want to start in verse 5 and talk about His uniqueness. First of all, Jesus' coming was very humble. The language that Paul uses here is very expressive. We're told in no uncertain terms that Jesus was a real man. He made himself of no reputation. That means too empty. He 
emptied himself. He voluntarily laid aside some of his divine prerogatives or attributes when he came into this world. For example, omnipresence. When he was in a body, he couldn't be everywhere at once, could he? To some degree, omniscience. The Creator made Himself dependent upon the creature for sustenance. As a baby, He had to learn and grow and, and be fed and be taken care of and all those things. You see what I'm saying? He laid aside voluntarily certain attributes of His deity. He took upon Him the form of a servant. The word form means the essence of something, that which strikes the eye. For all appearances, Jesus would have passed for an ordinary man. Isaiah 53 tells us that. There was nothing special about him that we would, that we would choose him. He was, just, he was just an ordinary man. When they came to arrest him in the garden, he had to be identified, didn't he, as to which one to take. He looked like the rest of the men around him. God in the flesh was rejected by the very people that claimed to worship Him, serve Him, and love Him. He came into His own, John says, and His own received Him not. But it goes on to say that as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Glory, hallelujah. He was made in the likeness of men. The word likeness means in the very image of something. In the beginning of creation, God made man in His image, didn't He? Genesis chapter 1. God made man in His image. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God made Himself in man's image. He took upon Himself the image, the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, fashion means the habits of, uh, com uh, as comprising everything in a person which strikes the senses, the figure, the bearing, discourse, actions, manner of life. Jesus was born as a man. That's the point I'm making. He lived as a man. He suffered as a man. He died as a man or like other men. He was in every sense a real, genuine human man. He knew pain. He knew poverty. He knew sorrow. He knew loneliness. He knew rejection. He knew laughter. He knew hope. He knew friendship. He knew every aspect of human existence, yet he knew no sin. That's what separates him, or one of the things that separates him from the ordinary. He knew no sin. He voluntarily came to this world, subjected himself to human experience, so that he might identify himself with you and me. See, because we needed a kinsman redeemer, he became our near kinsman. It had to be man die for man. So God became man. So that he could die for all men. Jesus did not see being of the same essence as God something to be grasped on to. Or in other words, he, he, he let go of it for our good. He let go of it for a brief period of time for our good. He willingly turned it loose for us. He did it to save us, to identify with us, and to help us. He became our kinsman redeemer. His coming was not only humble, but His coming was holy. Verse 6 says that Jesus was in the form of God. In the likeness, the form of God. This word refers to the very essence of God. It is a statement of fact that Jesus was God, is God, forever shall be God. Before Bethlehem, Jesus was God. It goes on to tell us that He remained God when He was here. Even though He was 100% man, he didn't cease to be God. He was 100% God. Yes, He laid aside certain attributes of His deity, but He still was 100% God all the while. Jesus Christ, the God-man, He merely concealed His heavenly fame within an earthly frame. 
every now and then, his deity overwhelmed his humanity and manifested itself, didn't it? Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Matthew chapter 17. He took his inner circle of disciples up the mountain and he was transformed before them and shone in brightness. And they marveled at it. And Elijah and Moses uh, appeared there with him and he talked with them. And Peter, like Cliff, opened his big mouth. And you know that story. And I won't get into that. His advent was holy because when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God literally came into this world to walk among men. The result was a perfectly sinless life, a perfectly sinless existence, a perfectly sinless human being, if you will. There's no one else in the world like Him. The rest of humanity was born bearing the stain of Adam's sin, but not Jesus, because He had no earthly father. He was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Ghost, by God. So He had no earthly father. He did not inherit that sin nature. He alone was holy in His birth. Nobody ever came into this world like He did. And then we find that He is unique in His conquest, in the things that He conquered. Verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We're told that Jesus, the God-man, willingly allowed Himself to be overtaken by death. The Roman soldiers didn't overpower him. They didn't bleed him out. They didn't listen. He allowed every bit of it to happen because he chose that. He chose it for you and he chose it for me because there was no other way. Yes, he prayed, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But there was no other way and he chose to go through with it for you and for me. He didn't spill a drop of blood. He shed it. He poured it out purposefully, intentionally for you and me. And for all the world. The prince of life ultimately entered the jaws of death. The one who is the resurrection and the life humbled himself and allowed the cruel fingers of death to grasp themselves around him so that we might experience his life. So that he could offer us forgiveness and eternal life. The death he died was no ordinary death. The Bible says it this way, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. No more brutal form of exec execution has ever existed in the history of the world. Jesus died in horrible agony so that I might live in boundless glory. Jesus died in horrible agony so that you might live in boundless glory. Won't you accept Him? Won't you embrace Him? Won't you receive Him? as your own personal Savior today. And if you have, won't you praise Him and lift up His holy name today because without Him, you'd still be hell-bound on the road to destruction. In death, Jesus provided redemption that's sufficient for the whole world. I'm not telling you everybody in the world is saved or going to be saved, but I'm telling you He provided, <clears throat> he provided redemption sufficient for the whole world. <coughs> he also demonstrated the boundless love of God for sinners when He died on that cross. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When Jesus died on that cross, He opened the way to God for all who want to be saved, for all who will receive His gracious offer of salvation for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it's the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast Jesus didn't just become a man for the time that he lived down here even after he died and rose again he still bears the form the identification 
of humanity. Let me hasten to say that Jesus is not limited today. He laid aside certain attributes of His deity temporarily. He took them up again after His resurrection, okay? Through the eternal Spirit, He's able to be with every one of us, every one of His children, every one of His followers. He's able to be with us everywhere at the same time. In heaven today, Jesus still bears the marks and the wounds of His suffering at Calvary. You can find that out in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 6. When we see Him over there, we'll see Him as God. But we'll also see the man who died for our sins on the cross and who still bears the marks, the scars, of that experience in his body. Throughout eternity, the spotless bride of Christ, that's the church, that's you and me, church, the spotless bride of Christ will be reminded of the price that was paid for her redemption. Every time we look at him, we'll be reminded of what our redemption cost and we'll praise him louder. And we'll praise Him more purely. I believe that eternity will ring loudly with the praises for Him who became man so that men might be able to get to God. Nobody has ever conquered like He did. Then I want to show you that He is unique in His commendation. Because of the love he displayed and the price he paid both on earth and in eternity we're told that God has highly exalted Jesus phrase means to raise to the utmost of majesty there are three areas mentioned in which God has highly exalted Jesus first of all his name We're told that Jesus has been given a name which is above every name. The name of Jesus is the sweetest name I know. I told a church in revival this past summer that there's some names I love to hear. I love the sweet name Michelle because it's my wife. I love the name Hagen because that's my son. I love the name Lazarus because that's my grandson. But no other name caused me to stand to attention and tears start to come down my face and honor and glory and majesty start to exude from my heart like the name Jesus. At the name Jesus, lives have been altered. At the name of Jesus, fevered brows have been cooled. At the name of Jesus, blinded eyes have opened. At the name of Jesus, deaf ears have been unstopped. At the name of Jesus, sin shackles have fallen away. At the name of Jesus, night has turned to day. At the name of Jesus, defeat has been swallowed up in victory. At the name of Jesus, hope has replaced hopelessness. At the name of Jesus, dead men have come to life. At the name of Jesus, lost men have been found. At the name of Jesus, devils and demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, sinners have been broken. At the name of Jesus, saints have shouted. At the name of Jesus, angels have bowed. Can anyone get excited about the name of Jesus in his house today? More has been done through the agency and the power of the name that is above all other names. The name of Jesus than all the rest of the people combined that this world's ever known. There really is just something about that name, isn't it? The name of Jesus is the sweetest name ever to fall upon human ears. That name is a cause for celebration in heaven. Do you know that? It ought to be the cause for celebration in the house of God today. That's the name that changed my life. That's the name that opened my eyes. That's the name 
that saved my soul. There's just something about that name. It's sweeter than any other. We're told that there's a day coming when every person will bow before Him and confess Him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Think about that. One day, every lost sinner will bow before Him and give Him glory. One day, the devil himself will bow before Him and honor Him for who He is. One day, every demon of hell will call Jesus Lord. Now, they're not going to be saved. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they will acknowledge Him. Demons already did it when He walked to earth. But they will acknowledge Him for who He really is. You know what all those lost sinners that bowed before Him in that day at the great white throne, you know what they're going to hear? I gave you opportunity to repent and you repented not. Go to the place of your own choosing and it's going to be a lake of fire. Throughout history, men have ridiculed him, mocked him, ignored him. Today, his name is a byword. It's mocked and ridiculed by the lost world. But the day is coming when that name and the person that it represents will receive glory and honor that he is worthy. And I say hallelujah Amen. to that. God declares Jesus to be Lord. If He is Lord, then He's worthy to be loved, to be served, to be worshipped, and to be obeyed. If He is Lord, then He is worthy of our times, our talents, and our treasure. If He is Lord, then He deserves first place in our hearts and in our lives. If He is Lord, then He should be exalted, praised, and loved. If He is Lord, then let Him be Lord of all. I call on you today. Will you let Him be Lord of your life? You see, He is Lord, whether you know it or not. He is Lord, whether you like it or not. Won't you receive Him to be your Lord? Please, today. He died and rose again because He loves you. Because He wanted to offer you salvation. Because He wanted to invite you into the family of God. Won't you receive Him today? Won't you repent before God and, and, and believe the gospel, believe God's record about His Son as to who He is and what He's done for you and be gloriously saved. Will you bow with me, dear Father? We bow before You. We thank You, Lord. We thank You for Jesus, that name above every name, that name most precious. And I ask You, God, today that every heart here will humbly bow before You. If we're saved and maybe we've been saved for years, we will, we will praise You and worship You and, and thank You. God, if there's someone that's lost, I pray to God today they'll humbly bow before you and receive Jesus. Receive salvation and freedom, liberty in Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Will you stand?